Hello, my name is Jaru, and today we're doing a quick reaction to the Undertale Deltarune newsletter for winter 2024, apparently. Um, <laughs> uh, this just came out, uh, it's like 7.21pm uh, on Tuesday, where I'm at, uh, so I'm just going to give you my quick reactions, thoughts, analysis, etc. of the uh newsletter if i sound tired that's because i just finished a two hour recording session of the lore playthrough and i wasn't expecting this to come out today so you know there's that but i digress let's take a look and see what mr fox has in store for us uh first off we see sands in a little construction hat using a uh Oh, what is it called? Bulldozer to shove a bunch of Valentine's Day chocolate and stuff away. Presumably in reference to him being, you know, well, one, beloved in general, but also the, uh, the Tumblr sexy man. Uh, so that's pretty great. Um, all right. Uh, uh, let me just check and see uh, what this image is called. The Sans... <laughs> Uh, this, this image is called the Sands Dozer. <laughs> so that's funny. Love. There's nothing in this world more important. Love. That's everything. And so today, we at the Undertale Delta Newsletter Corporation have decided to do something very special for our beloved fans. You're our Valentines. Please enjoy these three special cards. Um... This is this is a really <laughs> this is a really funny little spiel, especially since love has such a terrifying connotation in this franchise. Uh, one second, let me just. This is called Rouse Two N. Oh wait, Rouse Valentine's. All right, maybe I'll we'll figure it out. Anyway, dear Susie. I'm really happy you enjoyed my Valentine's card with the candy attached, but maybe you don't need to eat all of the other ones to check if they're food. They're food. Stop moving my hand when I'm right. Susie's the best? Um, oh, so like she ate everything, even the non-food, to see if they were also food? Okay, I think I get it now. Took me a second. Um, and Susie's interrupting his writing to rewrite things, which is similar to what she does in the cyber world when she rewrites Ralsei's cyberpedia entry. Um, although I do find it very adorable that Ralsei is the one writing a Valentine's Day letter to Susie. That's fascinating. That's a ship nobody has really, I think, expected to see pushed. I mean, I guess you can love someone platonically and non-romantically. I'm not sure that's what Valentine's is for, but interesting nonetheless. Um, in the context of my various theories surrounding Ralsei, I think he's tied up with Asriel. And Asriel is a known purple dragon lady uh, enjoyer. So maybe Ralsei's inherited some of that and has some uh, feelings for Susie. That's fascinating. If you told me that I was going to see Ralsei, <laughs> Ralsei x Susie lore in this newsletter, I would not have guessed. Dear Valentine, I read your letter. I understand. You are challenging me to see who the best Valentine is. Well, I won't lose. Meet me outside as soon as you read this, and tell Sans to bring the red frilly construction paper. You know, some of Papyrus' jokes go over my head. It is interesting, though, to see Papyrus again. It's been a while. Um, okay, I mean, cute to see Ralse, or see uh, Papyrus again. Um, <laughs> rules card. Yeah. Seeth if thou can solveth this puzzle, Valentine. Thou plus me equals blank. You start to draw a heart in the blank. What? No, stop. Stop. No, it's not that easy. Stop. <laughs> So, is the way it's being implied that, like, when they say Dear Valentine, they're saying, like, like you're my Valentine. So, like, if you have a partner, or, like, a romantic interest or something, you'd refer to them as your Valentine? 
Y'all are going to be in the comments and be like, wow, Jared doesn't understand the culture of Valentine's Day at all. And I'm just going to be like, I I'm an alien. I'm a robot. I don't understand these things. Um, rules card lore. That's interesting. I was just talking about in the lore playthrough how rules and papyrus fill very similar niches in their respective games. So that's interesting. Um... <laughs> rules x me <laughs> i mean he is a professional simp so this makes sense um what did you think did you enjoy your valentines well let me tell you there was only a fraction of what we've prepared you see there are slightly less than 50 different cards so trade with your friends to collect them all and don't try anything tricky i'm confused i'm very confused actually the more i think about it because this is on the toby fox website so, I I don't. This isn't like the newsletters you get in the mail. Um, forty three, twenty three. I mean, I'm willing to believe there's fifty of these, but I, I'm a little confused as to where they are. That's that's really confusing. Um, okay, Papyrus is looking in the mail, not finding anything. Uh. Papyrus checks mail. GIF. Uh, uh, UTDR's most lovable character special Valentine's message. Oh no. Oh no. How are those Valentines? Your heart must be practically jumping out of your body in joy and then moving around some sort of green square. Well, for some of you, it, it, some of you, well, for some of you least. Huh. Others might need a little more persuasion to enter love fever mode. Looking at you, non-truck freaks. Surely that's not what the battle mode is referred to as, love fever mode. In this case, we've got to bring out our secret weapon, a super special message direct from your favorite hero, a maestro of love, the cuddliest character, one who would stop at nothing to put a ring on it and get your heart. That's so funny. Because he gives rings to Noel and he wants to steal your soul. That's really, really funny. Uh... Okay. Okay, I guess I'll play this video here. Let me just turn down the volume. Uh, my daily reward, 18 plus, Friday, December 31st, 1999. Time, 11, 11 p.m. Now hiring someone to update this. this uh, <laughs> The year 20, 2000 approaches. The Earth will stop spinning. Get ready. I really, really want to kiss someone before the year 2000. I read that the Earth will stop spinning and it is concerning any takers. <laughs> Bounty, hearts and candy. A sweet surprise awaits. What is love's secret? The heart will reveal love's truth. Oh, God. Oh, God, the Spamped in Love Network. I was not prepared for this. No, no, go away. <laughs> oh, no. I'm gonna get copyright claimed to hell and back. Love lasts forever. Lunchables. <laughs> There's just a Lunchable. You're dead. You're dead. You died. Oh god. Hey Annie. <sighs> Happy V Day. It's me. Spampton, V Spampton, and you can't resist my. Are those monkeys on the wall? 
Frampton's kiss. Oh, I'm back in hell. All right. Spampton v. Spampton, back again. Don't forget about Spampton v. Spampton. And welcome, dear spender, to the Spampton Love Network. We are here to celebrate love, kissing, love, and it's Spampton. And today I'll be. Oh. I hear Spampton's got a special Spampton surprise. Buy my love for only one Cromer. And if you accept. I'm just pausing for a moment, mostly for copyright reasons, but partially because I wanted you to know that I'm still alive. Oh, those are not monkeys. Those are sheep. Okay. If you, if you notice I'm not really giving much input on the lore of this, it's because there isn't any. I... What is happening with his pants? You know, when people it watch... Oh. Spamton, my dear, a special Valentine's surprise? People were like... When I reacted to the original version, the original Spamton's Value Network, people were like, I don't get what you don't like about this. Um, or like, I don't get why you don't find this hilarious. And it's not that I don't respect the craft. It's just that it kind of hard boils my brain and gives me nothing to say. Well, I mean, it gives me so much to say, but then it melts it out of my brain because I'm losing my mind. So just in case you are wondering. <laughs> oh, it looks like my Valentine's prize is a bountiful feast. And I wonder who my lucky's date is. I've got something for you. Lip lipstick? So I'm okay. Now who's my lucky gal? Oh Happy Valentine's Day. What now, sir? Official lovers now hiring. I don't know why I'm pausing to read things. We don't know what happened.
when air is detected, I see the intensity of, you see this, that they something, where, where is the promise of perfection? Let me just, let me just, yeah, see if there's anything here. This is a warning. If my fears surging through me like suspicious waves. this text then something where is the okay um okay yeah we're back at the newsletter now um that was that was something thank you for the for the for the brain damage um, Delta mini status update. Here we have Rouse adorably offering a Valentine's Day card or confession letter or something to that effect to somebody. Who is it that they're giving it to? Unknown. Uh, Delta mini status update. Happy 2024, everyone. The Delta team and I were taking a break for the holidays to visit our families, but now everyone's back and excited to get back to the game. Regarding Chapter 3, we are working on the Japanese localization. Then we will begin porting and bug testing the chapter, after which it will be totally complete. Nice! As mentioned last time, the team is now mainly focusing on Chapter 4, with some minor work being done in Chapter 5. We've set two in internal deadlines for ourselves regarding Chapter 4, and our new producer is going to help us make the sweet, sweet moves we need to make to meet it. I'm confident this is going to be a really productive year. As, always, as usual, there's not much I can share without spoiling anything, so please look at this cup. Who's in the cup? <coughs> um, yeah, so last time we talked, or last time uh, Toby, you know, gave us information about the release schedule, I think he said that he's releasing Chapter 3 and 4 together rather than 3, 4, and 5 together. So the fact that 3 is done, and it's February means there's a non-zero chance that we get chapter three and four this year. So that's cool. Um, what is this? <laughs> uh, Cup Waka. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I suppose it do do that. Valentine's New Year illustration by Saffron Scarf. Saffron Scarf informed me that the year of the bunny and the year of the dragon are right next to each other. Hey, that's kind of romantic, isn't it? So she drew something. Uh, we have the Royal Guards 1 and 2 eating, I don't know, pancakes and donuts over a, a Vulcan. Uh, on the left, we have the Bunny Royal Guard, and on the right, we have the Dragon Royal Guard. These are, as far as we currently know, the only gay male um, representation in Undertale or Deltarune. Uh, so it's nice to see them get this at least. They're eating ramen. This also has Vulcan's face for some reason. Um, they're looking at fireworks in the underground. Um, I don't know if any of this is lore, or specifically a new home. Um, I don't know if any of this is lore or not. Especially since they seem to be standing on a grassy hill. And I don't think there is grass in the underground. Let me just check these images. Comic Guards 1, Comic Guards 2, Comic Guards 3. Cool. Um, let me check something real quick. All right, yeah. Um, that was that was cute. I, I appreciated that. Uh, so, you know, better than nothing. Special newsletter, spotlight, and interview, Gigi. Uh, this issue we got special here with a special friend, Gigi, or Gigi. Uh, Gigi has been helping me with concept art since Undertale. 
They're an amazing artist with an unparalleled sense for color and fashion. Their most prominent work shown so far has been the Dark World costumes of Chris and Susie and the background concept art for Chapter 2. But they've been contributing many designs for the next chapters as well, so look forward to it. Anyway, on to the interview. Okay. Guess we'll open that and go over. Interview GG. Huh. Is, is this GG? News. Very cute art. Uh, not much to say here, though. Well, Ralsei holding a golden flower is, or a white and yellow flower is slightly, <laughs> slightly funny, considering he's very much the flowey of this game in many ways. Toby, we met back on Twitter when I was just a musical rando making tweets at you. I really looked up to you back then. Okay, maybe I still, still do do a little now, too. What was your impression of me, though? Please, <laughs> GG, please allow me to recount a memory of the first time I exhibited at a convention. When I was walking toward the event hall, you happened to be nearby, talking with some friends about which artists you were looking forward to meeting. Because you knew I was in earshot, you shouted, I'm really excited to see GDG. This being the first time we met in person, I thought, ah, it's that guy. Anyway, I mean all of this to say that I thought you were weird. I was also weird, so it makes sense that we got along. My earliest memories of you are as an energetic and fearless little dog. Many people don't remember, but Undertale was initially released as a demo back in 2012. The demo only contained the ruins area, but what was your impression of Undertale from it? Uh, GG. I was shocked that you you made it. Of course, I didn't mean this in a disparaging way. I knew you were talented, but the thought of basically one person making such a coherent game was staggering to me. Before I met you and other developer friends, I had never considered that just making a video game, let alone a good one, was something people could do on their own. It was amazing. As for the content of the demo, I'm not sure if I ever told you this, but when I first played, I killed Toriel, and the hint to try for a different outcome went completely over my head. It was only after I watched a mutual friend play that I got it, which pushed, which pushed my impression from pretty impressed to shocked. By the way, thanks for doing this promotional art for me that I put on Steam. GG, it was my pleasure. I'm still fond of it, though I think I could do the, f do the foreshortening better now. Um, yep, uh, this is great on Dine Art. I've used it, uh, an edited version of it to represent the Roaring Knight in my famous Roaring Knight video. I say famous. It just has a lot of views. That doesn't mean it's famous. It sounds like I'm bragging. It's, I'm not trying to brag. Toby, you were the one of the playtesters of Undertale, and so you were able to play the final game before it released. How did you feel about the completed game? And what do you think would happen when it was released? I was already shocked by the demo, so the actual completion of the entire game was a bigger shock. Though it feels almost cliche to say, I never played anything like it before. I can't pretend to have predicted just how influential it would become, but I truly felt at the time that it was a remarkable achievement. I also clearly remember that when you asked me if I found anything in the game to be annoying, I answered, without hesitation, Onion Son. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Understandable. I respect that answer. Uh, Toby, there was a period of time you shipped Sans and Toriel, observing. GG, I don't understand why this is in the past tense. Uh, <laughs> Toby, I still have memories of showing you and Chess a dramatic battle from Undertale in a hotel room. I remember it was the first time I had shown the battle to anyone else. Wasn't that the battle with Sans? Do you guys remember this? Also, I will also include Chess for this question. Come, Chess, come here. <laughs> I think some memories might be blending together here. I do remember when you showed me the Undying the Undying battle in a hotel hallway, having to quickly flip down your laptop whenever someone stopped to talk. I also remember when you showed Chess and me the early parts of Deltrune the night before we went to Korea. But my most vivid memory of the Sands fight is playtesting it on my own. I believe the battle was toned down a bit to accommodate me. Chess, being much better at games than I, had to do it the real way. Tangentially, I remember a few moments during my initial playthrough when I would message you for insight on how to proceed. You'd always get really intense and respond along the lines of, It's your choice. I felt slightly like a horror movie protagonist. Chess, I somehow don't remember this at all. I'm pretty sure my first time seeing the Sans fight was on my own playthrough. I do at least have a memory of being the first playtester to defeat Sans, but it's been long enough that I don't 
and I can't be certain of whether that's true or not. I do remember being shown some mid-development Undertale stuff in a hotel room, but the thing I remember seeing wasn't Sans. It was a debug demonstration of a random attack where you had to maneuver around beneath a creature with very long ledge legs. Um, I think that's a Temi attack, if I recall correctly. I remember thinking it was really fun. Actually, didn't you tell me much later this attack was going to be in its own standalone minigame or something? I remember you really had lofty ambitions for it. The Legend of Leg. I will talk about Leg in a different episode. Not a question. Oh my god. You know what? I changed my mind. I am a Metaton fan. Uh, not a question, but originally I made a fan song for your character, Noisemaker, from your old webcomic, or your old comic, Cucumber Quest. I was big into making music for webcomics back then. This ended up being partially remade and repurposed as Metaton's theme. Uh, let me just lower the volume a little. And also, let me see what its name is. Okay, yeah. Uh, the name of the song is just Noise Master. Should I be worried about copyright? Maybe. That's a really cool version of this song. That's cool. It's interesting because, like, while there's ob the Metaton portion is obvious, it, it still doesn't feel like the Metaton version. It's like there's a central theme and idea to the Metaton themes uh, or music that isn't quite present here. It feels like this is adjacent to Metaton's, like, kind of sphere of influence, but not quite in it. Like, this does feel like it's about a different character. So that's kind of neat. Um,. Wow. Like, goddamn. Wow. Noise MTT is what this is called. 10 out of 10. Like, holy Christ. <laughs> um, whoa. The core being. The core looks interesting. Huh. Anyway. Uh, phenomenal art like oh I gotta move on uh, GG again it was my pleasure I was so thrilled by the noise master theme when I first heard it that I listened to it on repeat for days and yes of course I remember it was very it was a very self-indulgent drawing thanks for inspiring me also do you remember this art self-indulgent uh, yeah um, I mean, I like this more than I li like anything about Metaton in the actual game. So, uh, I have been indulged. Uh, 
Toby, I remember back when the game came out, you were instrumental in initially spreading the word about it. You let me take out a banner ad on your webcomic that stayed up there for months. Even though Twitter existed back then, the internet was quite a bit smaller, so I feel like it probably made a little bit of a difference. I really appreciated that. Huh. You even put an Undertale reference directly in the comic by including a scene where one of the characters wears slippers of Toriel's face, which are now, seven years later, actually becoming merchandise, as well as sort of appearing in Deltarune themselves. What? Oh, Toriel does wear slippers in Chapter 2, so I guess that's what it's referencing? I never forget these slippers. Fangamer, if you're reading this, please send me and Gigi free slippers and also Chess and also Temmie. Gigi, looking back at the idea of... A banner ad for Undertale on a piddly little webcomic page like mine is absurd. The internet really has changed so much in only a few years. At the time, I was just proud of my friend and wanted to show off the game he'd worked so hard on. I would certainly appreciate a pair of those slippers, though. This is a really cute comic. Like, I don't know what's going on at all, but the characters have a really cute art style. A little Toriel face. Not a uh, question again, but hey... Guys, Gigi also drew this poster, the Metaton poster. Indeed. I've looked at this poster before. It's uh, pretty nice. Um, oh, the Metaton poster. It was fun adapting a tiny pixel asset into a complete illustration. It reminded me of when I used to redraw the covers of, from Neopets books as a kid. I barrel ahead to my next point, which without giving readers a chance to ask any questions. Come to think of it, you should have commissioned a full illustration of that big BB poster from Metaton's room. I would have hung that on my own wall. That's hilarious. Uh, who's your favorite character from Delta Room? Susie. I'm also very fond of Noelle and Ralse. In Chapter 1, I would have agreed with this sentiment. Susie's pretty fantastic. In Chapter 2... Uh, I mean, Spamton exists. Who's your least favorite character from Delta Rune? Uh, you mentioned once in a live stream that one of your friends reacted so negatively to Rule's card that you thought he would be widely hated. I was the friend. That's hilarious. Oh, this is fun. So, this is obviously a fancy version of the, um entrance hall to queen's mansion but what's funny is like you can see her holding like a planet and a wine glass and stuff this is actually referencing an unused version of giga queen in the files uh and it's that version which you can see the legs of but you never see the rest of her um i might put that on screen here i make no promises uh, let me just check that is there a piece of art that you've made for undertale slash deltrune that really sticks out to you or that you're particularly proud of the work I'm most proud of is all in Chapter 3. I lost count of how many times I told this looks too good when I turned in a piece of concept art. Of what's been shown already, I think back most fondly on my art for Chapter 2 Cyber City. Um, I'm also very happy every time I put the main characters in new outfits. I also enjoy characters and outfits. I wish we had more custom customizability of the protagonists, to be honest, but I, I enjoy their base designs well enough. These are some very nice concept arts. <laughs> Giga Chad Butler over here. Queen sitting on a thing. Uh, keyboard and mouse. It was just like a full blown computer thing. Neat. Um, yeah, these are all great. To uh, yeah, Toby. Gigi drew the concept art for Chapter 3 pretty early on, so as the chapter evolved, sadly, many of the actual in game assets ended up deviating from these concepts. We'll definitely show their concept art after the chapter is released, though. So this is like uh, some sort of television set, and if they're showing it here, then that means that it probably looks nothing like this in the full game, but interesting. Um, chapter 3 concept art. Neat. Uh, Western Susie and Western Chris. Yeah, and if you saw my character design ranking, you'll know I did not think fondly of either of these, especially Western Chris, but that's a personal preference. Uh, what are you most excited to see in Deltarune? Not that this art is bad, mind you. I just don't like the aesthetic. Uh, what are you most excited for to see in Deltarune? Live, uh, or GG. You live, you live script readings were mentioned in 
a previous DR team interview, I believe. While you read through the story outline for me and a few others some time ago, I think I was pretty quiet through most of it, but one particular moment we were all, yeah, like I'd been possessed by a demon. So probably that moment. Um, that's crazy. Anything else you'd like to share with the class? Any memories of us? Anything about my game during development, after development, etc.? Except for the one time we went to Korea, we can't. GG. Ah, cheese bong. La Mau. Um, actually, I do have a story about the Korea trip. On our last night there, we all stayed uh, in this super traditional inn, sleeping mats on the floor and all, but we ended up ordering pizza for dinner. Anyway, at one point, the conversation turned to music production. I remember crowding around your laptop on the little table in the communal area, watching you give a Magagoli-addled demo of how you arranged Megalovania in FL Studio. I was too embarrassed to say so at the time, but I always wanted to try my hand at making music of my own. Somehow that demo was the right time in my life that music felt like something appro approachable to me, so I look back at it fondly. Thanks for that. Cheese bong is a Korean fish sausage snack. Oh, I see. Lamau. Thanks, Gigi. Who, who is this? Is this a real life person? You're scaring me, Toby. I, I can't make comments about real life people. It's inappropriate. Well, this is very nice art. It's cool to see Jevil and this uh, very pretty lady. I will leave no further comments. Moving on. Um, okay, game music. You may have heard that I made music for a certain game recently. Yes, uh, a very certain game. Yes, with a totally out of nowhere collaboration. That's right, Soul of Sovereignty. Uh, I collaborated with Gigi on the soundtrack to their new visual novel, Soul of Sovereignty. The first chapter is now available for purchase. It's a linear story and only takes an hour or two to complete, so check it out. The game is intended for mature audiences, 18 plus only. Don't play this, kids. Soul of Sovereignty Prelude. It's on itch.io. Um, so, neat. Kudos to this. Um, I don't know. If, if that's something y'all want me to play, let me know. Maybe I'll make it a Kofi uh, goal. As I implied, the soundtrack to this was a collaboration. While the two of us both made our own independent tracks here and there, most of the tracks were created by the two of us passing project files back and forth. It honestly felt like a true 50-50 effort, or maybe even more 60-40 on the side of Gigi. Gigi. Gigi did mention that they wanted the soundtrack to sound like a PlayStation game, so I, well, I just sent them all the sounds I usually use, and we just went wild. Anyway, I don't really think I've ever collaborated so back and forth like this, so it was really fun. Plus, it's Gigi's debut as a composer, and I'm really proud. Solsov has a more serious fantasy atmosphere than Deltarune, but I think the appeal of the characters is similar in some ways. Like Deltarune, the characters and setting have a long history. Excuse you? Deltarune has a long history. All right. Um, well, you hear you heard it here first, folks. The world of Deltarune has a long history. That's not something you say about a game where you kind of half-assed the lore. This is implying... The fact that he even mentioned this implies that not only is there a long history to the Deltarune world, but that that lore and history is relevant in the modern day. Um, which certainly lends, lends some credence to the possibility of some of my theories. Uh, they are something that GG has... Uh, been turning around in their head for over 10 years, and it's hard to put it into words, but you can feel that. After meeting Loic and, and Ismay is is for just a moment, they feel like old friends, and it's hard to stop thinking about them. I already want to meet them again. Anyway, if you're interested in a magical fantasy story with a slight dusting of Clown Woman, I can't give a stronger recommendation. Oh, were those two characters in... In the image, in the interview, were those from this game? Okay, one second, pausing the recording. Okay, yes, glancing at their itch.io page, I'm pretty sure this is Loic, or however it's pronounced, and this is Isme, or however that's pronounced. Um, so, in other words, they are fictional characters, so I can say what I was actually going to say, which is that this is a very beautiful man, and this is a very beautiful woman. Like, 
Um, I probably shouldn't have whistled directly into my microphone like a complete moron, but I wanted to say I quite like the aesthetic of these characters. Uh, so thumbs up. And if it turns out I'm misunderstood and these are real people, I apologize sincerely. Um, so yeah, cool. Uh, clown woman. Ugh. Uh, oh yeah, don't forget to check out the soundtrack. Yeah, I, I mean, I won't check that right now, but y'all should do. Uh, here's Noelle in like a pink sweater getup, and she's walking up to Susie, and she's trying to, she's trying to work up the nerve to give her a Valentine's. Um, this is called Noelle Susie. Nothing much to say there. Um, cool. Cool cute nope no not really lore relevant they are real toriel slippers horrifying look if you were a freak i would tell you to put toriel on your feet but that would be weird so i won't say that that doesn't leave me with many other things to say though <laughs> very funny um toho danmaku toho danmaku kagura tobi and zun collaboration I am learning Japanese, but I'm nowhere close to pronouncing anything correctly. Uh, you might have heard, but the song of Toho creator Zune and I collaborated on is out now. It's a bit of a dream come true of mine for me, so give it a listen. Um, I'll listen to it in a minute, but this is obviously some sort of non-lore related collaboration, so I don't need to play it here. Tommy, Tommy also did the cover art for the song. Wow. Also, as of usual, she did all the sprites in the newsletter. Thank you, Tammy. Um, the annoying dog delivered a Valentine's to Papyrus, who was looking down. Is the implication that Papyrus doesn't receive Valentine's Day cards? I guess that's the, the narrative being told here, isn't it? Because, like... Yeah, he checked the mail for any Valentine's Day cards and didn't find any. And whereas Sans has like a horde of them. That's sad. It's, it's, I mean, I guess people would probably find Papyrus really annoying in real life. Huh. Yuzuru Hanyu Ripre. Considered to be one of the best ice skaters of all time, if not the best ice skater of all time, is ice skating to Megalovania. To explain the context, Yuzuro-san is currently planning, currently putting on a special one-man ice show called Repray. It tells a story inspired by his favorite RPG games. The performance uses many songs from games that he loves, including Lufia 2, which made me extremely happy. I won't spoil too much, but the plot seemed to be a bit inspired by Undertale, which was a wonderful surprise. It goes without saying, but it's a huge honor to have my music used in an event like this. Luckily, I was able to attend in person. It was one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. When he turned towards the stands, I screamed and felt like Winnie the Pooh for a second. I'm not sure if it's corny to share this, but we sent him some flowers before his performance. Oh my god. Hilarious. Seeing this flower arrangement fills you with determination. I'll let you guys know if there's ever a way for you to view the performance for yourselves. And then we have Alfie's with her adorable little Valentine and Undyne with her gigantic Valentine. Which, yeah, Alfie's, Undyne, yeah, nothing too special there. And then, of course, Sans leaves up all these Valentines to spell out the real star. Because he's an adorable little brother. Uh, or older brother. Whatever. He, they're adorable brothers. <laughs> That's really cute. I'm sure after that lovely newsletter, your heart must be going doki doki, ban ban, pico pico, and several other noises that only a doctor can properly diagnose. But there's one more thing. Tabby did an illustration for 8-4's New Year's card. I think I remember this. 8-4 is like a studio of some kind? Happy New Year. Are they the ones making Deltarune? I assume they're the ones making Deltarune. So we have Susie, Chris, Ralsei. Susie has something in her mouth. Ralsei has something else. Chris has an apple. Chris one makes sense. The dog is Toby. The dragon... Is that Temmie? 
I'm not sure. Cute, right? Hope everyone had an auspicious 2024 Year of the Dragon. Wait, what was this called? New Year's Postcard. Oh, it's the Year of the Dragon. That's why. I see now. See ya. Kissing booth. $50. <sighs> I hate him. I love him, but I hate him. All right, and that's everything. Sweet. Um, mostly just, mostly pretty harmless stuff. It's just Susie X Ralsei fodder. That's cute. Um, the rules card being a simp. Unless this is implying that Chris has a thing for rules card. But I somehow doubt that. Um, what a random ship that would be. Um, and mostly just that. Not much to discuss here. As far as lore is concerned. Yep. Pretty, uh, pretty by the books. All right. Cool. That's it for the newsletter. I, there was some interesting stuff in here. Very cute. Uh, not much in the way of, like, lore <laughs> or anything really uh, deep. But it was nice to get some information and even nicer to get free content. Um, <laughs> uh, the Spamton Value Network may have stolen a piece of my soul, which is Spamton's main mission. So kudos to Spamton, I guess. Anyway, uh, I think I'm going to wrap things up here. I hope you guys enjoyed this quick little reaction video. Uh, Actually, turns out there was another facet to this newsletter that I didn't quite realize existed. So you may have noticed there are slightly different Valentine's Day cards at the top here than there were before. And that's because which ones are here is random. <clears throat> and some are incredibly rare to get. In fact, it seems like some can only be gotten from the version of the newsletter that got emailed to people, whereas this is just on the Fangamer website. So, uh, in an effort to delay my reaction video from getting uploaded, uh, Toby made some of these really hard to find. Uh, you'll notice here it says less than 50 different cards. Yeah, uh, they weren't kidding. Uh, Toby clarified on Twitter that there's under 45, and uh, thanks to the supreme efforts of everyone in the community, shoutouts to everyone who worked to get, make this list a reality, um, we have collected all 44, which includes some very, very interesting lore reveals. So, <clears throat> don't worry, you don't gotta go looking for them, because I'm gonna show them all to you in this video. Uh, so let's take a look. Uh, and these are in order. The URLs for these, uh, for these little Valentine's Day cards show you, like, they're numbered. So this is the first one. It's also the first Sans one. There's a few Sans Valentines. So, uh, I'll read through these all. Dear recipient, give this card to your mom. Dear recipient's mom, give this card to your mom. Uh, very funny. Goes in line with Sans's many classic mom jokes. Uh, no lore, just kind of funny. Uh, next, this is the second uh, Valentine and the second Sans one. Uh, huh? It's Valentine's? And you're all alone without a single date? <laughs> you're joking, right? No dates, huh? You're serious. Well, don't worry. I got you covered. He puts his hand in yours. You are left holding a fistful of wrinkly fruits. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, I wasn't sure where this was going at first until I got to the end. Uh, yeah, dates. Dates are a type of fruit. A very, very strange type of fruit. Not terrible, but they're kind of strange. Anyway, funny joke, but uh, nothing too lore relevant. And then we have this. Huh? What did what day did you say it was? Um, so this is pretty funny. Deltrude and Undertale are very heavily associated with Halloween, and there's like references to Halloween throughout both games. So I don't know throughout both games, but it's been brought up in Deltrude at least. I remember that. Um, so 
pretty uh, fun. Um, not, again, nothing lore relevant. It's just pumpkins and w with witch hats and bats and cats and jack o' lanterns. Like, yeah, nothing. Uh, nothing too interesting. Some of these smaller jack o' lanterns kind of have faces similar to certain sprites in the game. I think. I'm not sure what it reminds me of though. Maybe I'm just imagining things. Uh, regardless, that's the last Sans uh, Valentine. Then we have Spampton. <laughs> um, I wonder if these are ordered from like most romanceable to least. <laughs> or like most beloved by the community to least beloved. That would be kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, to my, bleep, <laughs> to my dear beloved bleep. Bleep, bleep. Um... This is like a curse word. That's the implication. They say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. They say the way to a woman's heart is through his stomach. They, well, let me in. Let me in, please. They're killing me out here. They're drowning me in insulating foam. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, San, uh, Spam Tid's after a soul. He's after Chris's soul specifically, which is presumably why he talks about going for either a man's heart or a woman's heart, since Chris has no clearly defined identity, uh, gender identity, I should say. Um, as And of course, you know, well, let me in, let me in, please. They're killing me out here. Uh, they're drowning me in insulating foam. I mean, this... M might be a reference to that one Toby Fox image where he's like covered in like bubbles or f soap or something like that or foam I don't quite remember um <laughs> I have one friend uh let me see yeah uh shout out to uh Will McKenzie aka Czar Wiccan on Twitter <laughs> he uh he theorized that uh Basically, he argued that uh, a, an, an insulating substance is sheep's wool, which is maybe a reference to Azrael being dead. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, I would never have leapt to that conclusion, but to be fair, I have no idea what insulating foam is supposed to be referencing. So, you know, I'll accept that. Azrael, giga dead. This is proof. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I, it's hard to say what else there is in the lore department for this one. Second Spampton one. To the blank that cursed my blank. Why did you change your credit card number without telling me? I thought we had something. I thought we had a kids. I thought we had a set. And you're going to tear them all down? Now, it's interesting because the surface level stuff is that this is like Spampton scamming someone. Like, oh, you, you stole someone's credit card number. And so they changed their password. Um, and this is him complaining about it. However, if you interpret this through the romantic lens that it is hinting at, uh, it's kind of playing to the somebody that perhaps broke my heart. Uh, why did you change your phone number without telling me? I thought we had something. I we had kids. I thought we had a set. And you were going to... Now you're going to tear them all down? Um, this does remind me of that one line from the Sans and Sweet Spakes, where he's talking to Jevil, and he's saying, like, screw you and screw the ketchup kids, too. Um, so this might be another piece of evidence for that. That this, that, like, this might be directed at Jevil. Um, people often talk about how Spampton and Jevil have divorced energy. Uh, so this might be a reference to that. Um, but... Spampton's been screwed over by so many people that this could easily be a, 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 a it's a short list of people who this could be referencing. Uh, Queen, Mike, somebody else, Gaster, who knows. Oh, here's here's one. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is the third Spampton one. Dear Mommy and Daddy, I love you very much. I have attached leaked military documents from the Blam Thunder forums to the love you very much. 
if you ever want to see your son again, please check out the enclosed instruction booklet. Instruction book. Love letter for you dot text dot VBS. Um, <laughs> uh, let me double check if VBS is an actual file format. Yeah, I guess it is a real file format. Of course, it's bizarre that he would use the text format and the VBS format. Um, so there's there's some layers here. So it's written in part from a... It's meant to be a ransom note. And so it's partially written from the POV of some child or someone who's been taken ransom. Hence the dear mommy and daddy, I love you very much. Uh, but then it gets a little funny. A leak to military documents from the Blam Thunder forums. I think this is in reference to War Thunder because someone who was in the military leaked actual, like, military documents for, like, the blueprints or designs of certain tanks and stuff. And in order to, like, prove a point about how a tank should be designed or something. Or maybe it wasn't tanks, maybe it was a plane. I don't remember. Point is, that's what this is referencing. Uh, then it's like, I've attached leaked documents to the blank that you love very much. Uh, perhaps to the heart or to the hostage. Uh, if you ever want to see your son again, please check out the enclosed instruction booklet. And the book in question is love letter for you dot text dot VBS. Um, I mean, there's <laughs> mostly this is just some sort of incomprehensible scam slash ransom note. Uh, further emphasizing Spampton's morally dubious attitude. <laughs> um, however, it's just really funny to me as a proponent of Asriel is dead theory to see a line like if you ever want to see your son again and then it mentions check out the enclosed instruction book love letter for you and it's like there's an instruction book in the code it's like an unused version of Rousey's manual which gives you instructions on certain mechanics in the game and I mean <laughs> You could argue that's, you know, the existence of Ralsei is proof of something having happened to Asriel. Um, so that's the main line of thought I go down looking at this this whole thing. Um, big uh, Asriel's dust energy. Next, we have one from Ralsei. Uh, I just want to tell you, I think you're a wonderfully special person. I'm not sure if you're the type of person that only likes to have one Valentine, but if you would consider me one of yours, I would be overjoyed. I hope you have a special day with lots of love, Ralsei. I can, there's, what's, in, what's interesting to me is that Ralsei sends Valentines to both Susie and Lancer, but the Lancer one's kind of fake. We'll get to that in a minute. It's only the Susie one that's legitimate. But since we have Susie and Lancer, the, really the only other person this could be getting sent to is Chris. And I think that's further emphasized by the fact that there's no gender or pronouns or anything used in this. Uh, a special person. So, you know. Uh, and, you know, the blushing and all that jazz. Uh, so, if you would consider me one of yours, I'd be overjoyed. I hope you have a special day with lots of love, or else they... Yeah, this feels like something Ralsei would say to Chris. However, uh, obviously some people would say, oh, it's a meta thing. Ralsei's talking to us, the player, you know? Uh, which, I mean, I guess, could be. Next is, Dear Susie, I'm really happy you enjoyed my Valentine's card with the candy attached. But maybe you don't need to eat all of the other ones to check if they're food. They're food. Stop moving my hand when I'm writing. Susie, the best? Okay, yeah, so, uh, yeah. We already looked at this one, but basically, you know. <laughs> Rousey already sent a different Valentine's card to Susie, but she ate it because she thought it would be candy. Um, and this is him making another one. 
and she's messing with him while he writes. So that's pretty that's pretty funny. Um, and it does better... I mean, it's interesting because it further builds upon the idea of... Uh, that I mean, the fact that Rousey sends these two specifically, Susie and Chris, and nobody else, is interesting. Um, I mean, whether Rousey feels any actual romantic attraction to either of them is unclear, but it's clear that he cares a great deal about them, like maybe even loves them. So that's interesting. Uh, which brings us to the last one. Dear Lancer, this is not a valentine. This is It is a secret note I'm showing to you as I am writing it. Can you please tell Susie stop rolling up all the valentine papers into a giant tube and then trying to get me to pretend to smoke it? it I would really appreciate your assistance on this. And please stop bashfully pointing at this and yelling, is that for me? If you get Susie's attention, then she'll come over here and... Yeah. Um, I saw this pretty early on on Twitter, and I did not believe it at first. Um, so, the fact that he emphasizes that this is not a Valentine is like, you know, shotgun to, to that that ship. I don't know who's out here shipping Rousey and Lancer, but, yeah, well, died. <laughs> the ship is dead. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's mostly just silly. And it's a reference to the Rousey smoking weed meme. Um, and to how Lancer's a silly Billy. So, not much to say about that one. Uh, and then we get another one. Rousey gets a few. Oh, also, I forgot to be mentioning, like, how rare these are. Because it actually, in the URL, there's a letter attached. Uh, not letter. Like, the like it, there's a, a specific letter. And that letter, well, depending on what letter it is, tells you how rare it was. So, like, this Sans one is SR. So, Probably meaning super rare, which is why this was one of the... It took a while to find this one. By contrast, this one is N for normal. And obviously, uh, uh, and I found this pretty quick. Like, you can refresh it a few times and you'll probably get it. Uh, this one is rare. Uh, I did, it took me a while to get this one. Uh, this one's normal. This one's, You can get this pretty easily. This one's rare. This one's normal. This one's normal. This one's normal. This one's rare. And then this one's also rare. Dear Valentine, I wrote you some more Valentines, but they're up on the shelf. If if you have trouble reaching them, then... Oh, and he's in stool form. La Mau. I mean... This kind of implies that Ralsei wrote, like, one valentine for Susie and then, like, one valentine for Lancer, and the Lancer one was fake, and then wrote, like, a shelf full of valentines for Chris. Because Chris is the one who stood on Ralsei's back. Or that Ralsei offered to let stand on his back. So, yeah. I, I mean, Susie did too, but I suspect this is referencing Ralse, uh, Chris. So, yeah. Um... Uh, and it's Chris specifically who had trouble reaching the controls on the game, and this is and that's what Ralsei is referencing here. So yeah, um, definitely some Chris X Ralsei fodder. Uh, so this yeah, this is a rare Valentine. Uh, yeah, okay. This one's Lancer. This is a normal Valentine. Dear Valentino or Valentina, I've actually got some Valentina. On my desk right now. That's really funny. Um, your car smells like toothpaste. You must be a real pro at washing your mouth. This is interesting. Because. How many people. Have. Lancers. Like how many cars. Has Lancer been close enough to smell. Like he was in Queen's limo. That's about it. Like what else is there. So, I mean, this could be referencing, but the fact that he says, Dear Valentina or Valentina, makes it seem like he's talking to Chris. So, which is interesting, because that, that's him implying that Chris's car smells like toothpaste. Which is strange... 
because he says he calls Ralsei toothpaste boy. So unless Ralsei has a secret car I don't know about, this seems to be implying that Ralsei smells like toothpaste, and so does Chris's car. This feels like, you know, because I've mentioned before that I've always found the Ralsei, like Lancer calling Ralsei toothpaste boy, really confusing. But this, and this, so this seems like Toby Fox trying to clarify that you smell like toothpaste. Ralsei smells like toothpaste. Uh, but it's Chris's car that smells that way as well, implying that there's some connection between whatever Ralsei is and whatever something that's been in Chris's car. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that as someone who's been con uh, controlling Chris for a few chapters, Chris is never directly mentioned or described as being someone who brushes their teeth very much. And at the end of the day, it's Ralph Say who is described as Toothpaste Boy. So I, at the end of the day, someone who washes their or brushes their teeth every single day, it sounds like a kind of a, I don't know, it sounds like someone who's on top of all their chores and is always doing what they're supposed to, and that makes me think that this is supposed to be referencing Asriel. Asriel's kind of a notoriously goody two shoes. Um, he's the little sweetheart that everybody loves. So it sounds to me like this is saying Asriel and Rousey smell the same. That's how I read this. And I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to connect Rousey and Asriel. But it's bringing even more attention to that fact. Um, at the bare minimum, it could be implying that Rousey dresses in clothes that Asriel wore. And there have been mentions of choir robes, which might be what Rousey wears. So, you know, it's, uh, there's some interesting connections here, further fleshing out the, the Rousey and Asriel connections. Uh, but yeah, so this was a normal rarity. This is also a normal rarity. Dear Valentino or Valentina, take my spades, please. They're better than hearts because they have handles. <laughs> um, once again, Valentina or Valentino seems to imply this is to Chris. Um, because it's using like the Spanish he the male ending and female ending. That's why that seems like it's referring to one or the other. Uh and the reason, also a part of the reason why this seems like it's referencing Chris is because in Chapter 2, Lancer, you know, programs the computer to unload a million bajillion spades for Chris in order to free Chris. So, yeah. Um, this part's just a joke, I'm pretty sure. But, yeah. So, uh, this is yet another Chris one. Implying Lancer has a strange amount of fondness for Chris I'm which is kind of strange I, I guess these could be just generic but if they're generic then that makes this one confusing so I think they have to be targeted at Chris you're better than hearts because they have handles I mean the main hearts in the games are the souls a soul with a handle I mean a spade is designed to stab into the ground which is how dark fountains are created Interesting. I don't know. Hard to read that one. This one is number 13, and it's rare. Ho ho, who is this Lancer? It, 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 it sounds like he would be a great Valentine. Unfortunately, he's taken by me. Ho ho, lovely boy. Ho 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 ho. Um, there's two options for interpreting this one. Uh, one is a complete meme interpretation, and the other is the obvious interpretation. Uh, the meme one is that this uh, innocent little boy uh, with a mustache is in a relationship with Lancer and has been taken, and, and that's, uh, they're, they're just two peas in a pod, um, which is some deep Lancer lore. And then the obvious answer is that uh, the URL refers to this as Lancer 3, as in the third Lancer Valentine, which is revealing... <gasps> 
That mustached Lancer is the same person as regular Lancer. Oh my god. I might have to make a three-hour video diving into the implications of this incredible lore revelation. Next we have Toriel. This is Toriel number one, normal rarity. Dear Valentine, you are sweet as butterscotch. Or cinnamon, if you are allergic to butterscotch. Cinnamon is not sweet by itself, is it? I suppose it would have to be cinnamon sugar. Is that alright? Sincerely, Toriel. Nothing really to write about this. Um, I don't really know who she's writing to. I don't think it's Chris. Ignoring the... I mean, you could kind of see a mom giving her kid a valentine just to kind of make them feel better about themselves. But... It, it, even if... That's still a little weird. So... I think the only logical explanation, and plus there's the fact that, she, you know, she would know if Chris was allergic to butterscotch. <laughs> Chris is there, is her child. She'd know that. Um, which raises the question of who? It has to be someone that she likes enough to give a valentine, but not someone that she likes so much that she knows their allergies. The only person we, like, there's like, Two people that we see Toriel interacting with other than Chris, and they are Alfie's and uh, Sans. So either she sent this to Alfie's or she sent this to Sans. Take your pick. <laughs> um, Dear Valentine, this is the second one, it's also normal rarity. Uh, what? I read that as why was the F word so excited? And I was like, whoa, wait, Toriel? Uh, why was the fork so excited? Because it had valentines. I heard that joke, and I just thought it was so funny. Sincerely, Toriel. Um, we'll find later that it was Alfie's who told her that joke. Um, it's a nerd joke, though, so I don't really get it. Yeah, so the joke is that va like valent or valent means having multiple of something, and tines is having, like, pronged points. So it has multiple points. So the fork was excited because it had multiple points. It's a stupid pun. <laughs> um, it's way too niche to be... Uh, the only thing more incredible than Alfie's telling this joke is Toriel understanding it and then also finding it funny, proving that Toriel is also a giga nerd. This is the third Toriel one. Um, it is of rare. It is, it is a rare Valentine. Dear Valentine, did you hear about the brave prince who worked up the courage to give a letter to his dearest? It was a valiant time. I do hope you found this amusing. I did not, but I respect the effort. Uh, a brave prince who worked up the courage to give a letter to his dearest. I mean, I guess you could say this is a metaphor for... Um, Alfie's and Undyne, because, you know, an Undertale, because this is Undertale Toriel, but I should have pointed this out a long time ago. This is a mixture of Undertale and Deltarune characters. Oh, yeah. Which means that, oh, okay, I take this back then about the, her only interacting with Alfie's and Sans. That's true in Deltarune, but this is Undertale's Toriel. Undertale Toriel interacts with a fair few people. But obviously her closest relationship is with Sans. So probably Sans, but technically it could be a lot of people. Um, but yeah, the Sans, the skeleton, is kind of impossible to tell which Sans you're looking at. This could be either Undertale or Deltarune Sans. Spamton's only in Deltarune. Ralsei is only in Deltarune. Uh, Lancer's only in Deltarune. However, this is the only this is the uh, Delt Undertale version of Toriel. Um, so yeah, uh, this is almost probably, like, could you could maybe argue, other than, I mean, these could just be generic silly puns and you don't have to think about them. But this could also be a reference to how Undyne worked up the courage to give a letter to her dearest. So, there's that. Um, other than that, there's really no other princes in Undertale except Flowey slash, um, Asriel, but I don't think they count. Or at least I don't think that's who she's referring to. Unless she's implying that Asriel had some little sweetheart before he died. But beyond that, I have no idea. 
Um, this is the fourth Toriel one, also uh, rare. Dear Valentine, did you hear this one? Oh god, this one's so long. Did you hear about the Lovers Contest in the second month of the year? So, a February Lovers Contest. Everyone entered the contest in pairs, and one partner would have to hold the other up while standing on a wobbly board. Meanwhile, the partner in the air would have to write a love letter to the other. You may ask which was the most important metric for winning the contents. It was the balance time. I... I guess it's a pun on Valentine? That is a stretch, Toriel. Christ. Oh my god, that's 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 rough. <laughs> if this is referencing something, I have no idea. Oh god, Birdly. Uh, okay, this is probably Delta and Birdly. There's, I mean, there's only one. Dear potential lover, I have attached an IQ test. Solve this, and you'll have passed the first step to becoming my Valentine. Fail, and you'll once again lose Elo and drop down the power rankings. I expect everyone to try harder this year, and no colluding to cheat the system this time. <sighs> okay, other than showing that he's a total dork, um, for those not aware, ELO is like the ranking system used in chess. Like whatever your ELO is shows like how good at the game you are. If you win a match, your ELO goes up. If you lose a match, your ELO goes down. Um, he's a gamer nerd, so he makes game references. This is also used in a variety of video games. Um, also the fact that he's do saying and no colluding to cheat the system this time and I expect everyone to try harder this year suggests that nobody bothered with his stupid little IQ thing or actually no it implies that they colluded last year in order to cheat the system and make it to where everyone got really good on his IQ test which is really funny because it raises the question of who was doing the colluding like was everyone in class given these and then everyone like kind of teamed up and copy pasted the answers and so it looked like everyone should be his valentine i'm not really sure either way it's mostly just a silly little dorky thing birdly did this is the next one this one's rare dear fellow scholar i regret to inform you that your test results or lack thereof were not sufficient to become my valentine this year however i would like to inform you that you still have a chance for late admission. Depending on our, shall we say, extracurricular romance, I may be willing to overlook your marks. Please send over your resumes ASAP. Your new lover will be waiting. Nothing really to say here. It's just more of the same kind of gag. If there's lore here, I don't see any. Uh, next we have the only one from Noel. Um, obviously Christmas lights have been strung up because she's noelle happy holidays from the holidays she just turned it into a broadly non-valentine uh rum like christmas themed thing uh so makes sense uh nothing else to say there dear valentine if i keep you in my shed i would feed your cat food instead of dog food um yeah so this is papyrus uh <laughs> this is specifically undertale papyrus Hence the shed. Um, and it's a normal rarity. Uh, nothing fancy here. There's dog food in the shed. Um, in Undertale. So this is him saying he'd give you cat food. and Which is in his mind better than dog food. Because he doesn't like dogs. Specifically the annoying dog. Next is this one. Another normal rarity. Um, or normal Valentine's card. Dear Valentine, if you see Sans, please tell him to tear down the heart-shaped balloon stuck in the corner of the house from last year. A dog keeps getting tied up in it and becoming a floating 100-point hazard. <laughs> oh my god. That's fun. Because there's like video games where there's like balloons and you have to hit them in order to get like points. And so I, like, that's what this is all referencing. Um, and just more reflecting on Sans's like, you know, slobbish nature and his refusal to clean up the house. <laughs> So, uh, very cute. No lore. Uh, three, also a normal. Dear Valentine, I read your letter. I understand. You are challenging me to see who the best Valentine is. Well, I won't lose. Meet me outside as soon as you read this. And tell Sans to bring the red frilly construction paper. So, someone sent Papyrus a Valentine. 
and Papyrus took it as a challenge to go on a, a massive conquest to like become the best Valentine, and I guess make as many Valentine cards as possible or something? Something to that effect. Um, kudos to Papyrus for getting a Valentine, though. That's cute. Uh, <laughs> there's the one Jockington one. This is a rare Valentine. Dear Valentine, tennis ball. Dear, comma, Valentine, comma, tennis ball. I'm beginning to think that Jockington did not understand the assignment and thought he was just listing words. He is a big of heart, small of brain. Uh, <laughs> oh my god, my eyeballs. Um, this one's from Metaton. It's this big elaborate gif. Um, Christ, it's of normal rarity. Uh, to whom it may concern, you are seeing the letter. Be this letter because MTT uh, noticed you did not write me a Valentine this year. If you're stuck, I've enclosed a personalized card just for you. Take your or just for you to use. Take your time. MTT is accepting Valentine submissions all year, darling. Love Metaton. I don't think there's lore here, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Just reminding you that Metaton's uh, something of an egomaniac. Uh, roses are springing up. There's, like, fireworks and sparkles and spiraling crystal hearts. Nothing too lore relevant here. I mean, these holes up soul... These hearts up in the top right kind of look like the light blue soul. Maybe that's a reference. I have no idea. Next is Burger Pants, specifically Burger Pants. So this is the one from Undertale. My boss is insane. He writes a response by hand to every single one of his fans that sends him a valentine. And guess who has to deliver all of those? My hand, with a big smile, singing a special song, and doing a special dance, and wearing a special costume. I hate Valentine's Day. Wow, so not only is Metaton quite loyal to his fans, but uh, uh, Burger Pants' life is hell. So that's cute. Good old Burger Pants. Am I still recording? Yes, I am. All right, next one. Let's be real. Also from Burger Pants, this is a rare one. Uh, let's be real. Valentine's is just a cynical invention to trick hot people into buying chocolate and greeting cards. The only good part? Watching them all get exploited, seeing them having to buy in, hearing them fight each other because their par their partner didn't do enough for a fake day, just makes you laugh at how stupid everyone is, doesn't it? Dot dot dot. That uh, isn't a car for me, is it? Ah, classic. Cynical and hateful towards the world because he doesn't get enough love himself. Although he may not get enough love himself because he's cynical and hateful towards the world. So, bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy there, Burger Pants. Hathi um, shoots you with hearts. Which is what she does in battle. Very nice, Hathi. Thank you. This is of normal rarity. This is the first one from Undyne, and given her outfit and missing of an eye, we can tell this is Undertale Undyne. Dear Valentine, Nyah! That two-ton heart-shaped boulder in front of your door is for me. What? It's blocking the way? Wait, give me ten minutes. I'll punch a heart-shaped hole in it for you. So she, you can, I, I wonder if this is the boulder she was, refer, the, like the boulder she was referencing was the one from, uh, down here somewhere. Where is it? Yeah, I wonder if this is the heart-shaped boulder. That's pretty funny. Um, there's a feat for you, by the way. Um, Undyne is strong enough and... Oh, wait. That's interesting. Because we always knew Undyne was strong enough to lift boulders. But this gave a certain specific weight to how heavy of a boulder she could lift. And in Undertale... Or rather, sorry, in Deltarune, she's strong enough to lift cars, which also weigh around two tons. It's kind of interesting 
that Undyne is just as powerful in Undertale as she is in Deltarune. Or rather, just as powerful in Deltarune as she is in Undertale, despite there seemingly being less or perhaps no magic in the Deltarune universe. Or at least in the Light World. Very interesting. It raises some question about monster biology in Deltarune. Um, yeah, cute, cute, uh, cute card. Um, Undyne 2. Uh, normal rarity. Dear Valentine, are those other Valentines bothering you? I'll rip them, I'll shred them, and I'll make you an even bigger Valentine with the scraps. There's really only one person Undyne would send Valentines to. So this is uh, a pretty funny thought. But it also... There's two ways to read this. I, either Alfie's is bothered by all the Valentines she's received, or flustered by it, which is interesting. That people would be sending her, um, whatever it's called, uh, Valentine's. Or it's implying that uh, Alfie's is kind of sad into the fact that so people get so many, other other people get so many Valentine's and not her. And so Undyne seeing this is like, I'll go rip up their uh, Valentine's and use the shreds of their Valentine's to make you a big Valentine. Um, either way, it's cute. Not really lore relevant. Then we have one from Queen. Oh god, is this the... Yeah, this is the right one. This is a normal rarity. Running Valentimes dot exe. Uh, I think those might be the same crystal hearts from the Metaton one. And obviously everything's kind of glitching out. Nothing to say here. It's just Queen being Queen. Then we have the second Queen one. Happy Valentines as a special gift on our romantic drive. I will move the car at a rate 50... 50% more likely for you to survive. I've, I've definitely known some people in my life who uh, I would love if they would, when driving me places, if they would drive 50% slower. <laughs> oh, man. Some, people, some drivers, their attitude is there's only one possession position the pedal needs to be in, and that's flat against the floor. Oh, man. Uh, very cute. This is just a reference to how, you know, when she's driving us around in Chapter 2, her car eventually explodes. Um, then we have the third one, also normal rarity. Happy Valentine's Day to my ex. I have unblocked you for just long enough for you to remember how hot I am. Holy cow. The self-confidence and the roasting is brutal. Like, holy cow, queen. You didn't have to do king like that. Um... Okay, yeah, that seems to pretty blatantly spell out that King and Queen were an item, they have since broke up, and Queen is living her best life, while King is doing the opposite of living his best life. Um, very fun. Um, Alfie's, and this is Undertale Alfie's, you can tell because uh, the shape of the glasses and also the outfit. Um, oh, you can't actually tell. Um, the, the, the glasses are different shaped, but it's only visible in the talk sprite or like the talk portrait. It's not visible in the overworld sprite, but she is wearing a lab coat. So this is the Undertale Alfie's. Um, don't think this is a Valentine or anything, but you know, I just think you're neat. Unless it's weirder that it's not a Valentine. It's, you know, it's whichever one is most appropriate. <laughs> um, this is definitely something she would give to Undyne. Uh, and this is, at first I thought this might be giving to like Frisk. Because she's like, oh, this isn't a Valentine. But I'm realizing now that no, this is in, this is her being all Sundere and anime-esque, which is a thing she's into. She's like, it's not like I like you or anything. Um, so yeah, no. Just Undyne being, or Alfie's being silly towards Undyne. Uh, this is another, this is, <laughs> technically it's an anonymous letter, but it's labeled as another Alfie's one in the URL. So this is, uh, und this is Alfie sending a Valentine but not quite being nervous enough, or not quite being confident enough to admit that it's her sending it. Um, it's an anonymous letter. I don't know how to say this, but you're really cool. You're the kind of person I wish I could be. Dot, dot, dot. So a response isn't necessary, but if you do want to watch my AMVs, I put a QR code on the back. AMV stands for Animated Music Videos, I think. Or maybe it stands for Anime Music Videos. Probably Anime Music Videos. Because that's what Alfie's is into. And making your own AMVs is very much a thing from 
you know, early 2000s anime fans. So that's pretty funny. Um, so yeah, nothing much to say here. This is just, once again, Alfie's gushing over uh, either, I mean, I guess it could be Asgore because she does canonically have a crush on Asgore. Uh, but I think she's kind of moved on by this point. So it's probably to Undyne. Uh, and then this is another Alfie's. Why was the fort chemically excitable? Because it has va valent times. Wait, did, did Toriel mess up the joke? Why was the fork chemically excitable? Where's, where, where are you, Toriel? One second. Why was the fork so excited? Because it had valent tines. Why was the fork chemically excited? Because it had valent tines. So yeah, I think... Toriel messed up the joke, but that's funny. Jevil. Wee hee hee. Do you want to play a game? Oh, wait, sorry. Do you want to play a heart showing game? Then first, let me show you my spades, my clubs, my diamonds. Yeah. Not, not really much in the way of lore. I mean, I guess it's further hinting at the fact that Jevil either had someone who was into him or wishes he does and the only real contestants for who this could like who Jevil could possibly be romantically involved with are Sham who he was friends with and Spampton who has heavy divorced energy with Jevil um but yeah um this is also a reference to how you fight Jevil you you show your heart uh, and then fight him so uh, very fine, not super deep as far as the lore is concerned. <laughs> Here's Grilby from Undertale. It has to be Undertale Grilby because we haven't met Deltarune Grilby. Uh, he says nothing. Whether this is him sending a valentine and saying nothing, or him receiving a valentine and saying nothing, I don't know. Either way, makes sense. Oh boy. Um, yeah, this one's long. Um, and in fact, fun fact... This one's like almost definitely from Gaster. This is like the big one. Um, oh, I forgot to mention uh, the rarities. Uh, all these were normal. This one from Jevil is super rare. Um, that's its ranking, SR. Then this one from Grilby is super, super rare. And then this one is super, 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 super super rare <sighs> um yeah kind of crazy um and in fact shortly after it was uploaded it disappeared which makes sense given the end of the letter but we'll we'll talk about it now it's a strange letter it's more or less completely illegible but if you squint your eyes and you squint your heart for some reason you feel you could understand it well happy new year or was it the old year? Well, in any case, how is Deltarune? Or, as you are waiting patiently, the time is going round. There was even a rumor of Valentine's Day. How absurd. Every day is a day of love, if only you believe it so. Do you believe it so? So, the purpose of the message. I want to help. Yes, there was someone I wanted to help. I seem to have forgotten who. Yes, it's quite ironic, but I seem to have forgotten. Was it myself? No. Well, perhaps. Regardless, when I see them, I'm certain I will know it straight away. I never forget someone I don't remember. Will you help me? You are very odd, responding out loud to a letter, but you seem reliable. I will be counting on you. Now, put on your coat and wash your face, or put on your face and wash your coat. Not necessarily in that order, or in any order at all. Good bye. There was a sound like something walking away, and the letter was gone. Shortly after this was uploaded, um, it 
the website changed the image to become blank. Re 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 you know, which is connected to the fact that the letter went missing. So, yeah, there's a lot to break down here. Um, so, firstly, I've seen some people say that this isn't Gaster, or at the very least, isn't the person who we've been seeing talking on Twitter or in the intro of the game, because he's too goofy. He's too silly. He says a bunch of silly, silly things. But, one... That is implying that some of this is silly. And I think if you think it's silly, you might not realize how double-layered everything is in this message. And, but even, perhaps more importantly, even if Gaster is silly, that's not surprising at all. Remember, everyone's, like, half convinced that he's related to Sans and Papyrus, who are... 99% of the time, goofy goobers. However, there is one issue that has to be answered here, which is, who, which gaster is this? Because there could very well be two. Specifically, the Undertale gaster and the Deltarune gaster. Now, he's talking about Deltarune, which means this is probably the same entity that took over Toby's Twitter. Because that entity is the one that talks about the Deltarune, with a space between. Whether that's the same entity as we see in the intro of Deltarune Chapter 1 is unclear. And if they are the same entity, whether they are both the Undertale Gaster or the Deltarune Gaster is also unclear. However, it's pretty blatant that this is the same entity. This may have changed your mind on whether it's Gaster or not, but I do believe this is the same entity as we see on Twitter. So, with that in mind, let's break this down bit by bit. It's a strange letter. It's more or less completely illegible. That seems to imply that whatever we're looking at is in Wingdings, which is obviously illegible to anyone who doesn't know how to read Wingdings. Uh, however, if you squint your eyes and you squint your heart, for some reason you feel you could understand it. So this is further implying that whoever the POV character is, of like whoever it is that the Gaster on Twitter is talking to, I'm going to refer to him as Gaster for the purposes of this, because this is unscripted and it's too much effort to refer to him as anything else. So, whoever Gaster was talking to on Twitter is also the person he's talking to here. Now, obviously, you're going to be like, oh, he's talking to the player. But here's the thing. There's a narrative and there's a meta-narrative. They both exist simultaneously and they're focused on different things. Sure, this is talking to the player in the meta-narrative, but there's also going to be a narrative explanation for whatever this is, too. So, that's the main thing that I'm going to be interested in. I don't care what he has to say to the player. Um, so, this implies that whoever this is being sent to has a heart, ergo a soul, and somehow, through the power of their soul, they can understand this message which seems to only make sense to me if whoever this is has some sort of intri intrinsic connection to gaster which definitely makes sense because as i've talked about in more than one video and including the lore playthrough i do not believe that whoever gaster's talking to is chris i think it's someone else who i'm not so sure but i don't think it's chris um so, it's somebody with a soul. That's what we get here so far. Well, Happy New Year. Or, was it the old year? Oof, we're cooking. We are cooking already. This doesn't make any sense. Unless you believe in time loop theory. <laughs> oh, it's the new year? Oh, wait, it's not new, it's old. Because you're stuck in a time loop. That's why. 
I maybe there's some other explanation you can drum up to explain this, but I can't think of it. Maybe I'm blinded by my own theories, but I cannot think of any other explanation for this other than time loop theory. It it doesn't make sense. Otherwise. I cannot explain this otherwise. It's nonsense otherwise. So yeah. Right out the gate we're cooking. Uh, well, in any case, how is Delta Rune? Uh, consistently, this character has emphasized that the Delta Rune is something that he is involved with, he has created, that he has manifested, that he is something with. And notably, it's there's a space. So this is another case of a meta-narrative and the narrative diverging. Meta-narrative says he's talking about the video game of Deltarune. Narrative means that he's talking about something some plot device in the world of Deltarune called the Deltarune. In Undertale, the Deltarune was the thing, was the symbol that represented the Dreamer family. It was also, you know, an ancient prophecy symbol. In Undertale, the most prominent time we see the Deltarune is in Rousey's prophecy, which is another prophecy about the Deltarune, in which we see Three heroes banishing the angels' heaven, and at the center of the pillar of light that they are, I guess, banishing is the Delta Rune symbol, implying that, and that's the last thing we see the heroes do in the whole prophecy. So whatever this Delta Rune is, it is integral to the plot and climax of Delta Rune, the game. And somehow we've even been experiencing it whatever this delta rune is or not we but whoever this person's talking to again meta narrative talking about the game narrative whoever he's talking to who i don't think is chris has been involved with and experiencing some whatever this delta rune is is it magic is it a god is it a device is it a time machine is it a what is it Is it a person? A reality hopping machine? I don't know. I, I, there's an answer to this question, and I'm pretty sure it's right in the middle of my theories somewhere, but I haven't quite put a pin in it. As you are waiting patiently, the time is going around. <laughs> you, are, you are being really unsubtle in this thing, Toby Fox. Like, you're just... You're just being like, hey, wake up. Do you realize it's a time loop yet? Like going around as in in a circle. No one says this. Nobody says this. Unless time's a circle. <laughs> A.K.A. a time loop. Oh my god. As you are waiting patiently, the time is going around. Waiting patiently, which is in reference to the sign... The light blue soul is the soul of patience. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. I think whoever... I think the person he's talking to is the human who had the cyan soul. They had it in Undertale, and they died and got their soul stolen by Asgore. I'm guessing that in Deltrune, that human is still alive. They still have their patient soul, their light blue soul, and they're the one Gaster's been talking to all this time. Yeah. I've always suspected that Gaster was talking to a human other than Chris, and I think this is starting to narrow it down very, very much. Because it this, the science was specifically described as being all about waiting patiently. And Undertale is described as waiting patiently to, like, dethrone a monarch or something to that effect. So, if waiting patiently to take down Asgore was the science goal, soul's goal in Undertale, I bet it's waiting patiently to take down some other threat in this game. You, as for who I think it is, I'm guessing it's going to be the angel. 
It's the Angels of Heaven that needs to get banished by the Delta Rune, right? I'm betting that the Cyan Souls mission, its Terminator bloody mission, was Gaster being like, yo, go take out this angel. That, I'm, yep, that sounds right. That sounds like I'm closer to the truth, anyway. There was even a rumor of Valentine's Day. How absurd. Every day is a day of love, if only you believe it so. Do you believe it so? This one's interesting. This is where love having two different meanings comes into play. If we're looking at it through the lens of regular love, he thinks the idea of devoting love to a single day is absurd. Every day is about love, if you believe it so. Do you believe it so? Thing is, I've never felt like Gaster was all about love. I mean, I could be wrong, but nothing. I mean, maybe every, maybe he's motivated by love. You know, I've always kind of started to view Gaster through a William Afton, mad scientist kind of guy lens. But I'm beginning to wonder if he has some sympathetic goal at the heart of his character. Like someone he cares about, or some people he cares about? It's possible. However, there's also the other reading of love, which is level of violence. Every day is a day of violence, if only you believe it so. Do you believe it so? I mean, it is classic Toby Fox writing to have double meanings, you know? So. The way I would view this is that Gaster... It's saying Gaster is an entity associated with both love and violence. Perhaps violence in the name of love. Interesting. Interesting characterization. So, the purpose of the message. I want to help. Yes, there was someone I wanted to help. This further supports the idea that there's someone he cares about and wants to help. This also implies that this is a message Gaster sent to the Cyan Soul. I seem to have forgotten who. Yes, it's quite ironic, but I seem to have forgotten. This is fascinating, because there's kind of a Mandela effect in the Deltru and Undertale community, where we think that characters who've been shattered across time and space are forgotten, but we don't necessarily know that to be the case. All we know is that the Mont the uh, Goner kid mentions how, like, nobody knows, like, life went on without him or them, and they don't remember them anymore, which kind of made people think that everyone forgot about Gaster. Or rather, everyone forgot, like, all of the Goners and stuff were forgotten, including Gaster. But there's never any mention of Gaster having been forgotten, and in fact... You know, the Goners themselves talk about Gaster, so it's possible that Gaster wasn't forgotten. However, then we have this line in which he implies that Gaster being, or sorry, Gaster forgetting someone is ironic. And I feel like the only way that can be read is if he has in fact been forgotten. I mean, you could also argue that he's someone who makes others forget. So maybe it's ironic to have him forget. So may I guess you could still argue that he hasn't been forgotten, but he's involved with making people forget. Just that usually he's not the one doing the forgetting. So yeah, this is implying that Gaster is definitely involved with making people forget stuff. Either forgetting uh, him or forgetting the, pe the goners. But he, yeah, he's involved in that. It's in. I think this is pretty much, pretty heavily implying that he is directly responsible for making people forget things. But it's not normal for him to forget things. And there's someone he wanted to help, but he can't remember who. And then we get this line: "Was it myself?" Question mark. No. Dot dot dot. Well, perhaps. This has two. Readings, as always. One reading is, he was like, do I need to help myself? And he's like, no. 
And then he's kind of like, eh, well, perhaps. Like, so this is his way of saying that, like, he doesn't think he needs help. But then he's like, well, maybe I do, you know, like, uh, I don't know. It's just sort of a self-reflective, like, maybe he needs help, but not in the way he was imagining. However, the other option and the one that I think is kind of knocking us in the face is initially he's referring to himself. Like, like if this is Deltarune Gaster, this is him referring to Deltarune Gaster. Was it me, Deltarune Gaster, who needed help? No. Although, and then he's being a little cheeky here, he's saying, well, perhaps I do need help. But not me, me, the other me, the Undertale me. Which adds further evidence to the possibility that Gaster has been in cahoots with Gaster. So that's interesting. Regardless, when I see them, I'm certain I will know it straight away. I never forget someone I don't remember. Will you help me? When I see them, I'm certain I will know it straight away. I never forget someone I don't remember. This is interesting because this is all tied up in the idea of memory which is a pretty important concept, both in Undertale and Deltarune. Obviously, Deltarune's more, ever, uh, more important because Don't Forget is quite literally the core theme of the game. Um, not theme like literal theme, like narrative theme, but like musical theme. The song, Don't Forget. And when do people forget in Undertale? When you rewind time, when you reset the timeline, a.k.a. time loop. But I digress. Point is, given what we've learned from above, Gaster has been involved with making people forget. However, even when he forgets people, he can still remember them. Perhaps implying that he's found some trick that allows him to remember someone even after he's had it wiped from his mind. Which makes perfect sense! How else would he defeat an entity that can reset the timeline. He'd have to be able to remember things even when the entity wipes his memory. Because that's the whole issue with the uh, monsters in Undertale is that when the timeline is reset, they do get a little deja vu, but they don't actually remember the specifics of what happened. And so they're stuck. They can't free themselves. But in Deltarune, in order to battle the angel, who is in all likelihood a godlike entity who's trapped this place in a time loop, Gaster would have to be aware of the situation and be able to make plans to counter it. But the only way he'd be able to do that is if he could remember things. But the whole issue of, this, of the way time loops work in Undertale and Deltrune is that it wipes your memory when the timeline resets. I never forget someone I don't remember. I'm, I'm willing to bet that Gaster figured out the way... Like, he noticed that people have deja vu when you reset the timeline. He noticed that, and he did, he figured out how that works mechanically. He figured out exactly what it is in a person that remembers. Some part of you has to remember previous time loops, previous events in the timeline, even if your memory is wiped, in order for you to have deja vu. He figured that out somehow. He found whatever part of it, whatever part of you, remembers. Probably something in your soul. If your mind, your memories, memory seems to be part of the mind, but if your mind's wiped, the only thing left is the soul. And it's determination and like refusal to give up that allows Frisk to resist getting their mind wiped in the Battle of Azrael. So, yeah, I'm betting Gaster's, the only reason Gaster's able to combat the angel at all is because he's figured out a way to ensure that even when he forgets, he can remember. And that's what I think this is referencing. Because they mention deja vu. Whenever they see, and they always mention it, whenever they see Frisk, they're like, I feel like I remember you. I feel like I know you. I bet whatever Gaster's done, it makes it to where it, when he sees someone, he doesn't just go, oh, deja vu. He instantly, like, regains his memories of whoever that is. He's, he's mastered that mechanic to allow himself to always remember things once he gets it triggered. God, this is a massive lore dump. Christ! You have to read between the lines, but it's right there. 
And then the will you help me is interesting because there's two ways to read this. Either A, he's talking about the re remembering who it is thing. And he's like, help me remember who it is I need to help. Or B, he's just saying, help me help whoever it is he wants to help. And then, interestingly, he says, you are very odd responding out loud to a letter. Which is really funny because there's two lines. <laughs> I keep saying this. There's two ways to interpret it. Everything in... in Toby Fox's world has double meanings. It has minimum double meanings. It's usually a double meaning and a joke somehow. You are very odd responding out loud to a letter. What's so funny about this is that means Gaster sent him this note, or her, or them, sent the cyan soul the note. They read this. They got to this part of the note and then said out loud that yes, they will help Gaster. And yet, even though Gaster sent a letter... Gaster is still able to observe them and notice them responding out loud, which is bizarre <laughs> because, I mean, this implies, I mean, what we know about Gaster in Undertale was that he was shattered across space and time, which allowed him to kind of be everywhere at once and every when at once. Um, and the Goners kind of hinted this, that like, it's, it's rude to talk about someone who's listening. Um, so this kind of implies that Gaster, if this is the Undertale Gaster, then he's found a way to not only be everywhere at once, but also interact with the world and observe things in the world. Alternatively, this could be Deltarune Gaster. And if that's the case, then it could be that he's still intact and he's just spying on whoever received the letter. But the letter vanishes its contents, implying Gaster... Oh yeah, because they say at the end, there was a sound like something walking away and the letter was gone. Implying that like, yeah, there's some metaphysical stuff happening. Like some aspect of Gaster was here, it was speaking through the letter, and then when that, that presence, that essence left, so did the letter. That would suggest that either this is Undertale Gaster... Or Deltrun Gaster has done something very similar to Undertale Gaster that has allowed him to be kind of everywhere and every when at once. That, I mean, it could be that that specifically is what allowed him to remember things, even with the time loop reset and wiping his memory. Or that could be a different thing entirely. Either way, the Cyan Soul says, yes, I will help you. But you seem reliable. I will be counting on you. Now, put on your coat and wash your face. Or, put on your face and wash your coat. Not necessarily in that order, or in any order at all. Goodbye. Christ, this is a riddle. Now put on your coat and wash your face. Now, this pretty blatantly to me is referencing the Spamton sweepstakes. Because one of the things that is pretty blatantly gaster connected in that sweepstakes was where you could find this image of a chair with a coat hung over the back of it. Now we didn't know who that coat belonged to. We theorized it was Gaster, or we assumed as much. A like Gaster's coat, he's probably a scientist, maybe it was a lab coat. But this is implying, if not outright confirming, that whoever that coat belonged to was the person he's been talking to, not Gaster himself. And you know what color that coat was? Light blue. Meaning that, <laughs> in all likelihood, this is once again referring to the cyan soul. Wash your face. Put on your coat and wash your face. Implying there's something on their face. Makeup. A disguise. Or put on your face and wash your coat. You can put on... There's, <laughs> there's a couple ways put on your face can be read. Put on your face is a way some people describe putting on makeup. So this could imply that the cyan soul is a woman. Or at least someone who wears makeup. More distressingly, it could be referring to something. Whatever this soul is, it can change its face. Or perhaps wear no face at all. 
it, which kind of reminds me of the friend in the basement of Queen's Mansion, who's just a face. Ooh, can they detach their face and, like, send it floating about to spy for them? Oh, God. And then lastly, another way to read it is that this is kind of like the Invisible Man. In the Invisible Man movie, he's invisible, obviously. So in order to show his face, he puts a bunch of makeup on his face to kind of outline the, you know, the, broad, the broad structure of it. So whoever this could be invisible. And then wash your coat. Wash your coat. That implies that there's something that the coat is dirty. And if it's dirty, that means there's something on it. Dirt. Blood. And when he says, wash your face, I mean, that could refer to... I mean, that could refer to wiping off makeup. Could be referring to you're covered in blood or dirt or something and you need to wipe it off. Wash your face. Washing is all about cleaning. I mean, it seems like whoever this is, whatever the gaster wants them to do, it's probably morally pretty dubious. Not necessarily in that order. Or in any order at all. The phrasing of this is kind of strange. The sentence ends after not necessarily in that order. This sentiment's fine. So like you could, he's saying you could do any of these four things, but not necessarily in the order he presented, and then period, or in any order at all. So there's two ways to read this. I'm getting tired of saying that, but yeah. Either it's saying not necessarily in that order or in any order at all. So you could, if, it, if it's not in any order at all, that could be his way of saying you don't need to do any of this. Alternatively, he could be saying that the concept of order is irrelevant. Which would make sense in a time loop where the order of operations doesn't really matter. Time is kind of meaningless. But the other option is that he instead of saying this concept is completely separate from this sentiment. And so he's saying or you can do these things in any order at all. So it's, instead of saying you don't need to do it, like the concept of order is relevant, he's saying you could just do it in any order you please. This, I mean, there, obviously, like broadly speaking, this could be referring to either the time loop again, because the concept of order of operations, cause and effect, you know, past and the future, etc. They're kind of irrelevant in a time loop. And it could also be referring to whatever this entity is, whatever its capabilities are, and how they function. And as I discussed, there's so many different ways that an entity like this could function. If they're just a straight-up human, then they're a human with a coat, potentially wearing makeup. But if they're more than a human, or less than a human, they could have attributes and powers we have no idea no idea what it is but here's the thing when you click on that chair it turns into a dark void like a rippling dark void as if nothing's there anymore however sometimes when you clicked on that chair it would show that face the pink and yellow eyes with the smile the friend all right i think i'm convinced i think the friend is the cyan soul i think that's what i have to conclude now I think that's the only explanation. It's going to be really, really funny if me choosing to put the cyan soul in all my theory videos on the thumbnail ends up being immensely lore relevant. <laughs> oh my god, people are going to be like, oh my god, how did you think of that? It's like, dude, I just thought it looked nice. I like the color blue. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Goodbye. Is this a typo? I can't believe this is a typo. In the sense that I refuse to believe it. He split up the word good and by. And it, it doesn't say by. It's not B-Y-E. It's good space by. Good by what? Good by when? Good by soon? Good by some standard? It all, I mean, it has to be mean goodbyes and I'm leaving because he walks away immediately after. 
But obviously, it maybe by is an, like the name of someone. Like he's saying, like good dog, kind of way. Like goodbye. Perhaps by are the initials of somebody. I mean, there's tons of names this could represent. <sighs> there was the sound like something walking away, and the letter was gone. It's so weird how it's like and comma the letter was gone, or comma in any order at all. It's almost like it's disconnecting these two concepts. Or perhaps it's emphasizing how the order of operations doesn't matter. Maybe that's his point. That's why he's being all weird like this. He's being witty, but he's also emphasizing that typical rules don't apply. Whew. Okay, it took a while to break that down. Christ. Here I was thinking this wouldn't have any lore in this newsletter, and it just dumps this on me. Just uncovers so much. Fascinating. I hope you all thought that was interesting. Also, if you're wondering, like, because the URL says what the name of who it is. For this, it just says unknown. So, yeah. And next, uh, less serious, but still neat. Um, this is the one for these two characters, the weather forecast duo. Uh, and this is a super, super, super rare Valentine. And it says, Dear Lanino and no one else, you are my eternal moonshine and sunshine. Dear El Nina and no one else, you are my sweetest rain and nourishing cloud. Let's give this card to someone else to show how much we exclusively love each other. They are, monog they are monogamous. And deeply in love and want everybody to know it. Um, you know what? Good for them. <laughs> uh, it kind of reminds me of like, the two lovers in Ocarina of Time and Legend of Zelda, or uh, in Majora's Mask, who are like constantly dancing and hugging each other or whatever. Anyway, I mean, it's neat that we get the names of these two La Nino and El, Nin El Nina. L La Nino and El Nina. Oh yeah, and the name on this is La Nino El Nina 1. So, yeah, referring to both of them. Now we have Rules Guard, the most important character. So, like some of these other Valentinist senders, not necessarily the ones you got, aren't kind of hot with it. Aren't they, like, single? I mean, this could be referring to anyone. Literally anyone. Okay, not everyone, but definitely most of these characters. Like, there's a fair chunk of these characters that I can see rules card being interested in. Um, Queen, not the least of which. Um, so yeah, um, and uh, not necessarily the ones you got. Is him is a bit of a meta joke uh, about how when you're on the website itself, it only shows you three at a time. So if it was like two, if you got this and then two Lancer ones, he wants to clarify that he's not necessarily referring to Lancer here. So, I mean, not, not much to say here. Oh, as far as the rarity is concerned, though, the rarity on this was super, super, super rare. So, yeah, that's kind of nuts. This next one is normal. Dearest queen, giveth to queen, if not queen, thou art the mostest fairest maiden in all the cyberland. Please taketh me as thine valentine's lackey. Note, I don't remembereth what thou looketh like, so I'm givingest this to anyone. Um, that's kind of funny. It kind of implies that rules card can't remember faces very well. It is also kind of interesting how... One of the only other characters to mention the concept of forgetting someone is Rules Card, other than... <laughs> so, you know, take that as a gastric connection if you want. Um, then we have this one. This is another normal Rules Card. Uh, Seeth if thou if can, see if thou can solveth this puzzle, Valentine. Thou plus me equals blank. You start to draw hard in the blank. What? No, stop, stop, no, it's not that easy, stop! 
Oh, man. That's cute. It makes me kind of wonder who you is. Presumably it's not Chris. This might be a purely meta joke. Which would be interesting, because that would mean Rules Card is a consistently meta character in these. Because he refers to, uh, like, the other Valentines. He refers to... Potentially refers to the Gaster Valentine. And then, you know, it's kind of this meta, like, I'm filling in the thing. So that's interesting. And then last, but certainly not least, we have the final Valentine, number 44... Rules card again, but it's rare. Um, so, thou may have se seeneth this seemingly easy Valentinist puzzle going around. Thou plus me equals blank. Well, thou seeth the solution isn't to draw a heart in the blank. It actually forms a new sentence with the letters. Me, heart, meaning thou findeth me attractive. The U is a remainder of the addition process. <laughs> He's so stupid. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I mean, this is him referencing the concept of anagrams, which is really relevant in Deltarune for a variety of reasons, which is arguably another meta joke. Yeah. Um, me hot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, this might be hinting that there's some anagrams scattered throughout this whole thing. But if so, I'm not ready to go looking for them. Um, it, but yeah, so that is uh, all of these, whatever they're called, Valentine cards looked at and discussed. Holy cow, obviously the Gaster one was the most interesting one. But all of them were interesting or were fun to read. This, the amount of lore in this is nuts. Like, actually deranged how much Toby Fox shoved in here. Like, this is some of the most we've ever seen from Gaster. And I do not buy for one second that this isn't Gaster. So, yeah. Um, wow. All right. Um, thank you all very much uh, for watching. Uh, I'm going to just insert this right at the end of the video. <laughs> Peace out. Uh, like if you enjoyed, comment if you got something to say, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, have a fantastic day.